Good evening, everyone, and welcome to day six of our event. It's called 10 Days of Building a Pathway to Prosperity. As I like to say, we are only in the sixth inning and have already created some strong momentum. My name is Tim Blett, and I serve as the Hope Builders Board Chair. Tonight, I'm going to act as the MC, leading us through an exciting lineup of speakers, along with a quick update on Hope Builders. So team, if you can hit your video buttons. Um, so tonight, tonight you'll hear from Dominique Dawes, three-time Olympian, gold, Olympic gold medalist, and owner of Dominique Dawes Gymnastics Academy. Hey, Dominique, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, Hello. Hello, hello. Um, and Elsa Mendoza, um, Hope Builders Behavioral Technician graduate and behavioral technician in, uh, at Footprints. Welcome, Elsa. Glad to have you tonight. Um, Shauna Smith. Shauna is Hope Builders Executive Director. We also have Mr. Greg Palmer, uh, President and CEO of Supplemental Healthcare and a well-known philanthropist. So thank you, Greg, for, for joining us tonight. And then um, after we've heard from everybody, um, we'll wrap up with a quick Q&A down at the bottom of your screen. You should see a Q&A button. You can submit your questions and we'll do our best to answer them all. If we can't answer them all tonight, we'll be sure to get back to you uh, with the answers as a follow-up. Um, so before we jump in with both feet, I would like to extend a heartfelt thank you on behalf of the Hope Builders Board and the Hope Builders team for joining us tonight. Thank you so very much. For those of you who are new to Hope Builders, Hope Builders is a workforce development agency. We bridge the gap between young adults ages 18 to 28 and employers looking for highly skilled workers. We provide young adults with mentorship, life skills, and workforce training. And our focus at Hope Builders isn't just about finding them a job. It's about putting them on a career pathway to prosperity. The good news, we've helped over 6,000 young adults find their pathway. We have three training verticals, medical assisting, construction, and behavioral health. All three of these areas are experiencing really good, solid growth. This past year was filled with many challenges and some great victories. And tonight, we would like to share some exciting news with you straight out of the Hope Builders classroom. Despite the pandemic, Hope Builders has continued to grow and thrive. Last year, we introduced blended learning that's in-classroom learning combined with at-home programs. Plus, we have expanded our social enterprise operations. We call that operation Hope Builders Career Connections. This past year, Hope Builders enrolled 175 young adults with 95% of our graduates placed into construction and healthcare jobs. This generated nearly 400,000 in ongoing sustainable income for our social enterprise operations. And that is something we plan to triple in the next three years. To reinforce the impact Hope Builders is having with our young adults, let's review a couple comments from our graduates. Justine said, I have never been this motivated to achieve my goals and better myself as a person. David's comment was, Hope Builders opened a door for me. I have a chance to grow and actually be somebody. Maricela, I learned so many skills at Hope Builders. They helped me realize everything's possible. These comments provide us some good insight into how these grads feel after completing the program. So now, without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce tonight's keynote speaker, 
I'll go through a long list of accomplishments. Uh, Dominique is known in the gymnastics community as Awesome Dawson. I love that. Dominique has a 10-year member of the U.S. national gymnastics team, the 1994 U.S. all-around senior national champion, a three-time Olympian, a world championship silver and bronze medalist, and a member of the gold medal winning Magnificent Seven team in the 1996 Summer Olympics in Atlanta. She is the first African-American woman to win an individual Olympic medal in artistic gymnastics and the first black woman uh, or black person of any nationality to win an Olympic gold medal in gymnastics. She is one of only three female gymnasts to compete in three Olympics and was part of their medal winning teams. Barcelona, 1992, bronze. Atlanta, 1996, gold. Sydney, 2000, bronze. She is also the Olympic bronze medalist on floor exercise from the Atlanta, from the Atlanta games. So Dominique, if you can hit your video button and I'll continue forward here. She holds a minority interest in the Washington Spirit, DC's professional woman soccer team and was the co-chair of the President's Council for Fitness, Sports and Nutrition under the Obama administration. Here's an interesting one, a little bit maybe out of her comfort zone along the way. She starred in the Broadway hit musical, Greece and has been a motivational speaker for over 25 years. <laughs> Currently, Dominique runs her own gymnastics academy where her website states, we aspire to inspire every kid that walks through our doors. When we saw that, we knew that she was the perfect match for this audience. This statement is a fastball up the middle for our topic tonight. Dominique, I would have used gymnastics lingo, but I don't know it well enough. <laughs> okay. So tonight, the focus is unlocking your greatness. At Hope Builders, we believe there is greatness in everyone we meet. Mm -hmm. And our purpose is to unlock that greatness for each and every one of the young adults we serve. So now we'll share her life story that's been anything but conventional. Dominique, I'm going to start our conversation with a few questions. Sure. Hope Builder serves young adults 18 to 28 who have faced significant challenges, roadblocks, and barriers throughout their entire lives. Can you please share your background with a focus on the obstacles you faced as a young adult? Yeah, well, thank you so much, Tim, for this amazing opportunity and to the impact that Hope Builders has made throughout so many years and will continue to make and to all the, the sponsors and donors that have made this possible. I want to say thank you to each and every one of you all because you are truly changing lives, changing generations, changing families, changing communities. Um, I feel very honored and blessed to have the opportunity to speak with you all. And I will say that 44-year-old person that I am today, I have recognized that all the pain that I've gone through in life, um, no matter if it was in my athletic career, falling at the Olympic Games in 1996 in front of nearly 50,000 people in the Georgia Dome and billions of people watching, that pain of being an athlete or pain, uh, even being a young child coming from a very broken and dysfunctional home and, and witnessing years and years of abuse. And then also people know a little bit about the culture of the sport of gymnastics which is why I've motivated, I'm so motivated to run the academy that I'm running today, the Dominic Dawes Gymnastics and Ninja Academy. It is about aspiring each and every child that walks through our doors because each and every child has a special gift in them and I want them to recognize that. And so we're all about planting positive seeds of growth. But any pain that I've gone through, I recognize it served a greater purpose and it's led me to my passions in life, which I think has also allowed me to leave a greater impact in anything and everything that I'm pursuing. Um, I never thought that I would have ever been a motivational speaker. I remember being a young little fourth grader and having the squeakiest voice in school. And I remember speaking up at uh, my public school 
And I remember answering a question when I was this young little kid and everyone laughing at me because of my voice. It was a very high pitched voice. And people always think that Olympic athletes suck on helium and we do not suck on helium. That really is our voice. And so I remember just being very embarrassed and terrified as a child. And after that experience, I really created this shell, this wall, and I really didn't speak up very much after that. And so if anyone would have told me that I would be a motivational speaker someday and enjoying it and feeling very passionate about it and having the ability to leave such a lasting impact for nearly 25 plus years, I wouldn't have believed them. However, whenever I have the opportunity to get on a stage and share my words of wisdom, I do take myself back to my younger self that had a little bit of that painful experience. And I recognize, you know what, I've been blessed with this platform to make a difference in someone else's life. And also some of the surroundings that I had, I heard very many, many negative words, um, you know, people telling me that I was not going to amount to anything or I would not accomplish something. However, um, you know, I recognize today as a young woman and a speaker that words are so powerful. I used to have on my website that saying sticks and stones will break your bones, but words will never hurt you. And that was some saying that someone created and the name was the person's name was anonymous. And I thought it needs to remain anonymous because words are very impactful are very hurtful on people. Um, you know, if someone's ever gone through a tough time in life and they've heard negative words years later, decades later, you can still hear those maybe negative and hurtful words that are resonating in your ear. And I was a young person that felt that for much into my adult years. Um, and I wanted to make sure if I were going to speak words into someone else's life, that it would be ones that would give them hope. It would lift them up and help help them flourish in life. Well, that's uh, that that that's perfect for um, for our students um, because it's a pretty universal it's a pretty universal challenge that they've that that they have faced. So, going back to the squeaky voice, when you were in Greece, were you a singer in Greece or? Uh... <laughs> Kim, I am so thankful there's no footage of that. That was just an opportunity that I was, I guess, blessed to have, but I was not gifted in music, singing, dancing, or anything. It was just a fun opportunity. But I will say, um, and not to be so negative, but when I was in New York City in Manhattan and my name was in lights on 49th and Broadway, that was something that the world told me that that would lead to fulfillment and happiness and joy in my life. And I was the most miserable that I ever had, had, had ever been in my life. And I was very confused and almost getting to the part uh, point of depression because I was living the life that the world said would, be ha would lead to happiness and fulfillment. And I was doing very well for myself financially, but it wasn't where I was supposed to be. I wasn't making the impact and I wasn't in the environment where I could truly lift people up. And so while I was blessed to have that opportunity um, and to poorly perform on stage, um, I quickly realized that my gift and my talent and my treasures needed to be um, in a different arena. And that's what led me to take motivational speaking a lot more seriously, because that's where I truly felt like I was changing lives. Well, we have that in common. I was, uh, I didn't make the cut for the sixth grade choir. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so next question, um, talk a little bit about the role of perseverance and commitment and hard work on your personal journey. And, and how did you push yourself out of your comfort zone? You know, I am by nature a very private person, very introverted. And I think people are very surprised to hear that because when they see me on TV or they see me on stage or they hear some of the things that I was able to achieve with my life, they think, oh, she's, you know, very much, you know, an extroverted person. That's her comfort zone. She doesn't face any fear. Um, I was constantly dealing with a great deal of social anxiety. I was dealing with a great deal of um, uncertainty and insecurity and always doubting myself. However, what motivated me in the sport of gymnastics and even life today is recognizing truly the impact I could make on someone else's life. I remember when I was about, I think it was 11 years old in Rockville, Maryland, I competed in a big competition. I won the competition. And after that, I started getting a lot of fan mail letters, not just from people locally, but nationally, because I was also on the national team. And I remember being so excited to run home from school to see what fan mail letters I got, because little old me, who was this quiet, mute little girl in school at this point, um, you know, could impact someone else's life. And I remember opening letters and they were from mothers, fathers, grandmothers, grandfathers, and young, young little athletes out there saying, I watched you in this competition and you've made me want to dream big. And that 
was something that mattered to me because whenever I wanted to quit, I thought about, I'm not just quitting on myself, but I'm quitting on the impact I could make on someone else's life. And so knowing that I could plant that positive seed is really what helped me persevere. It wasn't just solely getting on top of a podium or making a certain amount of money, but it was really knowing that I could change someone else's life for the better. Wow, sounds like that inspiration and encouragement uh, played a significant role. That leads me to my next question. Um, at Hope Builders, we encourage our students to secure a mentor or two. And so did you have mentors that help guide you along your path? And you may even have new ones today uh, uh, as you continue on your journey. You know, there's, it's interesting in my walk in life, I have always leaned on my faith. And at times when I was going through my most darkest moments, when I felt as if I was alone, I know that he was there to strengthen me. So first and foremost, my faith has always been important to me and that has been um, my true guide. I've had a number of mentors in my life and a number of mentors in my life that showed me what I didn't want to do with my life, even though they were extremely you know, wealthy or successful or powerful, I remember looking at them as individuals and looking at their, the big picture of their, their marriage or the relationship with their families. And I was like, that's what I know I don't want. So when I've had people around me, I don't just, um, I don't just see, you know, the positives that I can, you know, the examples that would, they would give me of what I want to aspire to become like, but also looking at someone else's life and saying, hey, even though they've accomplished these great things, I don't think it was worth all that they've risked. And so I learned many times from a lot of people what not to do, um, and that's helped guide me a great deal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, next question, a number of Hope Builder trainees say the program helps them grow and feel more confident. Um, what would you say to them about the importance of believing in, in yourself? Um, to help you through um, some of those storms that you're yeah. certainly we're all gonna we're all gonna face. Yeah, we're all we're all human. We're all gonna go through pain. We're all gonna go through storms in life, and we just need to make sure we hold on to that one little glimmer of hope and to not give up. And you may go through you know points and periods in life like I have where I doubted myself or I was insecure or even falling into depression. I mean that's a big topic these days with regards to mental health, um, but also making sure you do have that support system that you can lean on and you can go to for comfort or for guidance when you maybe don't think as if you're strong enough. That's the thing in, in the sport of gymnastics, it is an individual sport. So as a young person, I was taught many times to just rely on myself. It was all about me, myself and I. However, um, you know, I realized that I need to learn to utilize and work with the team around me because that's something that's very important and helps us through those tough times in life. We don't, I mean, COVID, just think we're all affected by COVID. And those that I think have been the most affected were those that are in complete isolation and they have no one to lean on and to love and to converse with and to have that piece of hope that they can hold on to. So I think we need to recognize um, that, you know, leaning on each other is always a positive thing. And so, you know, when you may be doubting yourself, um, don't give up and just kind of continue to reach a little bit further and, you know, hope that the next day will just be a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Our, our program at Hope Builders is designed to help our students launch their career, not just get a job. Um, what advice would you give our young adults um, that you feel um, a specific example or something that you feel would be helpful for them um, as they as they hear from you and and look up to um, you know your commitment and, and and faith and and accomplishments et cetera? Well, I think always focusing on why you're doing something and it's not just about the paycheck but the impact that you can make on someone else's life. And I think that's something that people need to have at the forefront of whatever it is that they're doing. It's not just about collecting a paycheck. And I know they need to support themselves and they want to support their, their families, but looking at the bigger picture of the impact that they can make on the greater community. And even if they've, as if they've gone through painful moments in life, how can they help guide and help someone else that's maybe going through that experience or needs words of wisdom or words of inspiration. I think that's always important. One of my staff members at the gym heads my preschool 
my, my preschool space. We have a preschool program that targets ages four months to six years old. And this young lady is full of so much joy. And I asked her the other day, you are always so happy. You're always so smiling. And she reminded me, Dominique, when a two or a three or a four-year-old walks through the through the doors and they say something that's witty and that's funny, every I know that everything is right with the world. And so it's her making the decision to focus on those little things in life that many times we may be, you know, deaf to, or we may, you know, want to focus on those things that are our hardships or the challenges that we're going on in life. But she's focusing on these precious little innocent funny kids that are elated to see her each and every week. And I love that about, you know, her person and her character. And I think we all have that opportunity that, you know, if you put things in perspective, not everyone's waking up tomorrow. And when you do, let's say you're blessed and you do wake up to recognize that each and every day truly is a gift. And we need to ask ourselves, you know, how are we going to use this gift that we're blessed with? And how are we going to leave a lasting impact with this gift? And, you know, I think if you, Kind of look at life that way and not just focus on the negative, which is what a lot of, you know, former Olympians and gymnasts tend to do, but focus on the things that we should smile about and be happy about. Your whole perspective in life will change. Mm. Well said. Very well said. Um, I can imagine there were many lessons learned through competing at the highest levels of gymnastics that, you know, you've carried with you and used in other ways in life. Can you share uh, an example with us of, of what that might be or what that was? Um, you know, I think always, you know, I did the sport of gymnastics as I mentioned earlier um, and what helped me persevere was the impact that I could make on those around me. Um, that truly did guide me, that truly did motivate me, um, knowing that I could shape someone's perception of themselves, um, that I can teach them to dream big and being the first African-American to qualify to an Olympic team in 1992 in the sport of gymnastics for women's gymnastics, I knew it was huge that I was, you know, impacting and inspiring a whole race of people. And so recognizing that is really what has motivated me in my walk today, even as I started my gymnastics academy in the middle of a global pandemic, you know, like I recognize that it's all about shaping the lives around me and, and inspiring those around me and planting those positive seeds. And I think if we take the focus a little bit off of ourselves or our own personal, um, maybe just personal goals and recognize how am I, how am I shaping those around me? I think it becomes that much more fulfilling because it's a way that all of us doesn't, you don't have to be an Olympic gold medalist. You don't have to be a millionaire. You don't have to be known. You don't have to be, uh, you know, famous or anything. You know, you can truly leave a lasting legacy and change the world that we live in by making a difference in someone else's life. Teachers do it on a daily basis. Police officers do it on a daily basis. And you and I can do it on a daily basis. We just have, need to make that concerted, concerted effort to care and to recognize that our words are impactful, our actions are impactful, and even some inactions are impactful. And we need to make sure we're, we're trying to lift up those around us. Sure, there's been a lot of studies that say the more you serve, the more you give, the happier, you're truly going to be and that sounds like uh, that sounds like a big uh, a big part of your life um, can you take us back to that moment with the fall and and say wow what was she thinking and then what what was what 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 was next from that because um, you know that was a super big moment for you and our students and the people on this call they've, they've had those moments in different you know in different ways and so would love to hear from you uh, about that? You know, it's interesting because years after I fell at the 1996 Olympic Games, it was the all-around competition. I was on my best event, which is the floor exercise. I was a, a great tumbler, a great performer, and I was expected to medal in the all-around. And I had that opportunity, and I pretty much politely said I blew it. And it was humiliating. It was embarrassing. It was nothing I had planned for. And I remember for quite some time, years even, I beat myself up over it. And it was all coulda, woulda, shoulda. And as a professional athlete who just um, no longer was accepting a full scholarship to Stanford University, and I was now um, a professional athlete in the sport of gymnastics, obviously not falling would have helped me financially, you know, with my career. And so I remember beating myself up for years and years and years. And I got to one point and I really needed to think about things and self-reflect. And now today as a 44 year old mom and being married and a business owner, I'm so grateful 
that I had that pain happen in my life because I was able to learn so much about myself and my character and be able to then empathize um, and connect with others um, that it maybe have gone through similar type hardships in their life. Now, I've gone through much more pain than, believe it or not, falling, you know, in Olympic Games. Um, but that pain really did serve a greater purpose that truly has motivated me more today and allows me to great, leave a greater impact. And that's what I always say to people, when you've gone through a very painful moment in life, a loss, um, a level of trauma or even abuse, not that you, you know, you can't go back and erase it, right? And so what we don't wanna do is we don't want to remain stuck in that pain and bring it to our present in a negative way where we then are fixated on it and harboring on it or coulda, woulda, shoulda, or why didn't I have different parents or why didn't, why did this happen to me? But yet ask yourself, what can I learn from this? How can I not only get myself out of this rut, but how can I better serve those around me that are maybe going through the same thing that I went through when I was a younger person? And I think again, as a gymnastics gym owner, and knowing the kind of culture I came from in the gymnastics gym, I do not want that for my four kids. I'm a mom of four kids, a seven-year-old, soon to be six-year-old and three and a half-year-old twins. And I don't know how you're not hearing them scream upstairs, but I know I don't want my kids to experience what I experienced in the household, being a part of a very broken and dysfunctional and abusive family. And I don't want them to experience the unhealthy and abusive culture that I went through in the sport of gymnastics. Everyone knows the trauma from Larry Nassar, the Olympic team doctor. I knew him for 10 years of my childhood. And so I am very, believe it or not, grateful for a lot of the pain that I went through because I feel as if I'm better equipped to serve others and to help others and lift up others and not allow them to get stuck in a rut and stuck in that pain because I've been there before and you have to learn to let it go and you have to learn to forgive. And that is a very hard thing to do. But if you look at it from the perspective of yourself, that if you forgive others, it frees you. Forgive yourself, you're human. And if you need to forgive you know, um, a higher power, then do so so that you can be free and you can move on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sounds like um, that's based on the principle that when you go through those storms, it, there's, there's one of three outcomes. It can destroy you, it can define you, or it can develop you. And it sounds like it, it, it really helped. It really helped develop you. Um, so let's see here. Um, looking back across your life, what was one of the most courageous moments where you used your voice and your influence to drive change? I think it's what I'm doing now. Um, you know, I, I mean, I'm not trying to sell and pitch my, my gymnastics facility at all, but, you know, anyone that knows me and knows how I'm introverted and more private, never would think that I would have ever opened a gymnastics academy and wanting to build a community and be connected, connected with the community. However, um, you know, I feel very called and motivated to do this because of a, as a mother of four young kids, I wanna make sure my kids are in a very healthy and uplifting and empowering and encouraging environment. Something in which I lacked as a child, which is why, you know, I did lack as a child, a great deal of happiness and joy. Um, and um, even being content with a lot of things, nothing ever felt good enough because I was told that all the time. And so, um, you know, that's, you know, I think it's, you would, it, it takes a great deal of courage, I feel like to do um, what I'm doing right now. It's a business that myself and my husband own and operate hundred percent. It's been a pretty big risk, um, but the people that we're serving and the people that we're impacting um, are truly worth it. Uh, uh, excellent. So um, a couple last questions. I went back through and watched a few of your interviews from your Olympic career. And, you know, there was a lot of discussion about teammates and, and you and teammates and, and our students have a lot of peer groups that are, that are you know, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of comparison going on and, 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 and how do you break through? How do you, how do you unify? How do you, you know, sometimes you got to break away. Sometimes you got to unify. Um, maybe you could share some of your oh. thoughts on that. I mean, I would say it would be for all teams in life, you really have to take your ego and put it aside. And that's something that the 1996 Olympic team did extremely well. Now we of course had the talent. Um, we had some luck on our side, we were healthy. Um, but what we did is we really 
took our focus just on ourselves and feeling as if we had all the answers to everything. We took our large egos, which each and of us, each and every one of us had. I was a, that was my second Olympic games. Shannon Miller, it was her second Olympic games. Carrie Strug was a former Olympian. Uh, Mochiano was a national champion. Amanda Borden, JC Phelps, Amy Chow, they had world championship medals and national championship um, achievements. And so what we did collectively is we took our egos and we put it aside and we supported one another. And we recognized that we could do so much more collectively. And you can only do that if you look over at your fellow teammate as a friend, as a teammate and not as a competitor. Um, you know, I've been in an environment where it was always me, myself and I, and it was all about that person's way or the highway. And in that setting, we stepped back and we were cheering for one another. We were we were giving one another high fives. We were believing in one another. We were respecting one another and we were appreciating each and every person's contribution and voice that they brought to the team. Even if it wasn't something that we agreed with, we were very respectful and recognized that we could do so much more together. And so that's the message I would give to your, your teams there is you really have to take your ego and you have to set it aside. And I know we all come from different experiences in life and viewpoints. However, it's very good to step back and be open to at least listening um, with regards to someone else's viewpoint um, on something and recognize that, you know, you're going to do so much more working with your team versus against your team. And I experience that on a day-to-day -day basis as a, a CEO of a, an academy, I have 22 plus employees and you know everyone should recognize that they have a voice and they should be heard. And so I know I may run things, but I also am very open to input because um, you know my sole way of thinking is not always the right way of thinking. Mm. So uh, a quick last question for now, we'll circle back at the end. Um, is there anything that we didn't cover that you'd like to share with the audience? Oh, um, goodness. I mean, I, I, I guess I can't stress enough uh, what I had mentioned a few times, just pain that we go through in life um, you know, really does you know, serve a greater purpose and that it does take a great deal of self-reflection. It does take a great deal of prayer. It takes a great deal of pruning unhealthy people from your life for you to then be able to be free and move forward. And I've gone through it in my life and I'm sure I will continue to go through it in my life. Um, but do you see that, you know, this, the challenges, the setbacks, the obstacles that we all face in life, you know, if you hold on to, and that's why I love your, your, um, your title hope builders. If you hold on to that little glimmer of hope, um, you will be able to be developed. Like you mentioned earlier, um, from painful moments and challenges and setbacks, and it will make you stronger. Um, but it's not something that you can just sit on, but it takes an active effort and a conscious effort. And trust me, I am not the most optimistic. Um, I am not the most, um, you know, courageous. I am constantly full of fear um, and that I am always reverting back to thinking that I'm not enough just because I do constantly hear those words. Uh, but I have to remind myself this is not going to, this hasn't defined me. This is not going to break me. And I then persevere through by taking the focus off of myself and putting it on that of which I'm passionate about. And it truly is about changing the lives of those around me. Oh, wow. Okay. So from that shy young girl with the squeaky voice to motivational speaker, oh, you are <laughs> excellent. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah, no, really, uh, really, really good stuff. Um, I can, I, I can feel the energy, even though this is Zoom. Uh, so uh, thank you so very much for sharing. Uh, you know, I'm just convinced that your story will inspire all those that have, that, have tuned, that have tuned in today. So we will be back at you shortly. Um, thank you, everyone. Appreciate okay, it. thank you. Next up is Elsa. So Elsa, if you'll hit your camera, please. Elsa is a Hope Builders Behavioral Technician graduate and behavioral technician at Footprints. Tonight, she has graciously agreed to share how the program has given her the tools and the support to transfer, transform her life. So Elsa, take it away. Hi, my name is Elsa Mendoza. Uh, before coming to Hope Builders, I was struggling, you know, to stay on path and 
I was a young mom, had my first son when I was 15 years old. I was struggling with substance abuse and alcohol. Um, my mom had told me, Elsa, you know, you have to do something about yourself and you have to stop drinking and doing drugs. And I told her, mom, it's very hard. Don't judge me. Don't criticize me. With time, I, you know, had decided I was already tired of doing that and seeing my little one. So I finally had told my mom just I wanted to do my withdrawals by myself. Uh, she put me in my sister's room and I told her just take care of my little one. I want to do it by myself. So I've been sober till this day for 12 years now, which I'm very happy. It wasn't really easy, but thank God I did it. Um, I had to go to school since I was so young and I had to finish my high school diploma. My mom had told me, I don't know how you're going to do it, but you have to work and you have to be responsible. I had told her, how am I going to do it if I'm so young? She told me, well, you wanted to be an adult and have a child. So I was like, okay, I went to Taco Bell, which was close down my street, like 10, 15 minutes away. I went and they told me that I had to get a school permit. I went back to my school and they told me that I had to have good grades. So I finally talked to all my teachers and I mastered all my good grades. They finally gave me the permit. I had to go to work part-time and doing my school as well. My mom told me, you are gonna go walking. If you want me to take you, you have to give me gas money. I told her mom, how am I gonna do it with a part-time job? She told me, I don't know how you're gonna do it, but you can do it. So every time I would get paid, my mom would always take away my check. And she told me, this is for rent. This is for me to take care of your child. And this is for you. So I was only literally stuck with $50, $60. And I was like, okay, I can't complain. So I was saving little by little. Um, I finally, it was really hard going back and forth. And I finally met one of my friends that told me, Elsa, you know, you're burning yourself out too much. How about if you want to come and join where I'm working at, which is a temporary job, an agency. And I told her, um, they're gonna ask me for my school permit and I could only do part-time job. So when I went to that agency, they had told me, no, it's okay, you could work a full-time job. We don't need nothing from your school, which I was like, great. You know, I don't have to be dealing school and doing this. So I was finally lying to my mom that I would be going to school. So I would just go to work a full-time job. Um, agencies was just temporary jobs. It was just like a month or time to hire, which it was really hard and seasons would be ending, the job would end, I would have to go somewhere else. So agencies didn't have jobs, it was kind of hard. So I finally ended up having my second, third and fourth child before I was 19 years old. Um, it was very hard, you know, looking for a room by myself with four children and with me, I was five. People hardly wanted to rent me a room. Since my children were so small, people would be getting frustrated that they were crying. They would tell me, you know what, this is your last month. We're so sorry. I would always tell them, please understand, you know, they're small. So it was really hard. Um, with the money that I was saving, I had bought myself a van. Um, it was a minivan. We were living on the streets with my children because it was so hard for me, you know, to find a room. And apartments were so expensive and I was so young. I was not getting qualified for no financial aid, no food stamps since I was young and I needed my mother's um, bank's account and everything. And she just didn't want to give me all that. Sitting there for three hours, it was kind of hard. I had to work for those three hours. Every time I would drop them off to my mom's, she would always tell me, my kids would complain to her saying, grandma, we slept in the car and I would always tell my mom, mom, they're lying. You know, I took them on a uh, car ride, you know, for them to sleep because they didn't want to go to sleep. So in the morning, I would drop them off to her and I would go off to work. Um, I was just living off of WIC with my children. Every time that would come around, my children would always tell me, mom, what are we going to eat? I was just telling them we're going to eat pure eggs or you know, a tortilla with peanut butter and, you know, I would just cut up bananas. So they were already tired eating cereal. 
Every time, you know, at the 7-Eleven, the guy would always let me connect that cook burner, just eating cheap food because it was so hard to maintain myself. So I finally uh, met this person that told me, you know, Elsa, you have to, you know, get your high school diploma. I went to Centennial Park. They told me that for adult school, I would have to be doing four to five hours in the nighttime, which I know that it was really hard because no one wanted to take care of my children for free. So I told them that is not an option for me. I still continued going agency to agency. And it was just living and living every day goes by. And then someone finally told me, Elsa, this is a program that that's for you. It's a school. It's called CCPA that helps like young adults like you. So I went to school, you know, and I was like, how many credits do I need to do my high school diploma? They told me I had like 200 or something. And I was like, wow, that's going to be a lot. They told me you could just bring your packet in every week. Every day I would just be, you know, like sometimes making up stuff or filling in blanks and I would turn it in. My teacher would be like, Elsa, stop lying you know, do your work correctly. And it's going to be, you know, like half credit. And I was like, really half a credit's not going to help me. So that teacher finally um, left the school. I finally got another teacher. She, you know, she was really hard on me. She was like a really tough teacher. And Miss Lowe would always be there like behind my butt. And she saw that I was living in my car with my children. I was there every time with her, you know, she was helping me and I was turning in packets after packets. Um, after 2.5 years, I finally completed my high school. Then COVID had hit. So we finally had a drive through ceremony, which was, I was really proud of myself. I invited my family, which, you know, they were impressed because they would always doubt about me that I was unable to obtain my high school diploma. So with time, my teacher told me, Elsa, you know, I'm going to help you with the room for rent. So she finally gave me the opportunity, you know, like to set aside money and help myself with my children. Once I completed my high school diploma, my teacher had told me about Hope Builders. When I came to Hope Builders and I was looking at them, they told me, you know, you have to complete this course, um, this exam. And I was like, oh, great. I was like, if it has to do with math, I'm not gonna pass it. So I was deep down in my mind and I was telling the secretary, Cynthia there, I was like, if I know what one plus one is two, I was like, but if I look at multiplication and everything and she started laughing, she's like, you're just gonna do great. So I finally passed it when she told me I was crying and I told her, well, I did it, you know, like I'm not dumb. Like I finally finished it. So when I was going, I was doing the course through Hope Builders, we had to do this assignment, which was um, through Santiago Canyon College at nighttime. I was working a second job at the nighttime. So when I, I was really hard because it was in the nighttime from 6 to 9 p.m. And every time I would always have to tell my supervisor or the people that were there, I have to do work, I have to log on. So every time I was hiding normally from like the owner because he would always come in the nighttime and I would always be taking the laptop, you know, to the restroom. And, you know, he was just looking at me every time going back and forth. And he's like, oh, so are you okay? No, I just, you know, like have stomach problems. But then I came to this point that he told me, are you gonna have stomach problems every time? So he finally caught me and I told him, you know, I have to be doing school. And I told him a little bit about my story. He finally told me it was okay for me to sit down and do my school and getting paid at the same time, but I was going to be doing office work. And I told him, I've never touched a computer in my life. And he was showing me software and like window and Excel and everything. And I was like, oh God, how am I going to do it? I have school. And then I have on top of that now this other job. So I told him I'm going through so much stress and he was just laughing. So I finally through once I finish, you know, like co builders and going through all, you know, like my course and having the support from all my team, you know, having like my teacher Shelby every time, you know, being there against me, you know, like just telling me, Elsa, you could do it, you know, it's okay, take a breather, you know, having Miss Ide going to interviews, it was like so nice because I was never doing interviews. I never knew how an interview was or how to dress appropriately or how to talk to people. 
So I was having really bad anxiety. Miss Isaiah going to, you know, interviews. She taught me, you know, exactly how to talk in a professional manner, how to overcome myself. And, you know, it, it was just nice having all that support from Hope Builders. Um, you know, I love like working with children with autism. When I finally finished the program and I was looking and indeed about, you know, like behavioral technician opportunities, I finally found my company Footprints. When I went through my first interview when they told me that I was gonna be getting $21 an hour, I literally told um, the person that was interviewing me, are we done? Because I didn't know if it was symptoms of a heart attack or what was it? Uh, I've never had that. Um, I literally told my mom, I don't feel good mom, can you take care of my children? I went to the ER uh, and the doctor literally laughed at me. He's like, what's wrong with you? I told him I'm gonna be getting paid $21 an hour which I've never in my life had experienced what it was getting a $21 an hour job. Um, it was really hard, but thank God now that I, you know, been helping so many families and people, you know, like better themselves and seeing the families smile that all these kids that I've been doing all this work and helping them improve. It's just been a blessing to me. And, you know, like how Dominique said, you know, like, it wasn't only about the job, it's about, you know, like making that impact and that difference in people's life. It's something, you know, that's rewarding for me since I also have a son on the spectrum. Um, you know, everything that I've learned throughout the time with my children of getting services and now I'm into implementing it with, you know, new families, it's just life-changing and everything is thanks, you know, to Hope Builders for making me the person that I am now. Wow. Elsa, um, when we first met and, and we talked about your story and, and we talked about the courage it would take to come here today and, and, and share it, um, you're fantastic. And we also talked about how this story is gonna help inspire others. It's gonna give others hope. And so uh, you just did a, a fabulous job uh, tonight. And so thank you, your perseverance and commitment uh, is truly an inspiration. Thank you. Uh, for us all. Thank you so, so very much. Okay. Um, next up. One of the, uh, one of the benefits of our program is providing support beyond the job search. As part of that effort, we are building a community of mentors. We talked about the importance of that. And we've heard about the importance of that tonight, uh, along with other graduates uh, to support each other as they navigate um, their careers. And, and we have a saying um, that reads like it does on the screen, once a hope builder, always a hope builder. We want, we want all of our graduates to leave with a badge of honor and uh, also uh, send a signal to the employers that are hiring them that, uh, uh, they're, they're, they're workforce ready, highly skilled, highly passionate uh, young adults. So um, with that, I'm now going to move forward uh, and I'm going to turn it over to Shauna. Um, Shauna is, as I said earlier, executive director for Hope Builders, and she's going to introduce today's benefactor, supplemental health care represented by Greg Palmer. So take it away, Shauna. Thank you so much for that introduction, Tim. And before I inter introduce Greg, I just want to thank Dominique and Elsa, who are, you know, uh, wise, compassionate, and inspiring, courageous women. And I just enjoyed so much hearing both of your stories today and all the little points um, of connection. So thank you for being with us and sharing your hearts with us today. It is my honor to introduce Greg Palmer, CEO of Supplemental Healthcare, and he's also a generous supporter of Hope Builders over many years. Supplemental Healthcare understands Hope Builders better than, than a lot of uh, companies because like us, they're serving the needs of employers in the healthcare industry, providing access to, to talent pipeline and skilled workforce. With a national reach, supplemental healthcare is truly a leader in their industry. They understand 
um, the benefit of a vetted and trained workforce and have invested in hope builders to help meet that need. I am truly grateful for their support. Thank you for being here with us this evening, Greg, and I look forward to, to hearing your comments. Thank you, Shauna. Appreciate, uh, appreciate that kind introduction. Um, gosh, what an evening, right? It, it's, it's been incredible uh, sitting here on the sidelines, listening to uh, Dominique and to Elsa's story. And, and guys, thank you so much for, for telling your stories, uh, for being so vulnerable. You're, you're, both of your backgrounds are uh, you know, truly inspiring. And, and the things you've overcome, I, I think, just fits, uh, you know, fits the, the mission at Hope Builders better than, you know, better than I could have imagined. Um, I'm Greg Palmer, the, the, the CEO at, at Supplemental Healthcare. We, we're one of the nation's largest home, uh, one of the largest staffing companies servicing hospitals, home health care, school districts, um, autism clinics, you name the setting, we, we will typically uh, have a health care provider in those settings. We do, we do nursing and we do allied professionals across, uh, across the United States. Um, I want to I want to really just talk for just a second. I've had the pleasure of getting to know Hope Builders for a number of years. I was first introduced to Hope Builders by one of the former board members, Mike Hagan, and I went to the first gala, and this was right around 20 years ago. And for 20 years, I, my family and I, we, we've been uh, we've been supporters, and and recently um, in joining Supplemental, I, I realized all the connecting points about how important it is to find good talent, how important it is to have them trained well, how, how important it is to support um, all the healthcare workers and all the employees that we have working for us across the country. And, and really the, the organization, you know, Hope Builders has, has done just a phenomenal job of doing it. I can remember that they started very humble beginnings and, and look at them now, they've got a large budget, they've got a large staff, they train hundreds of workers in within hundreds of companies, and being a little bit selfish, we're really excited the fact that they're taking on healthcare. We have um, we have about nine million jobs in our country that go unfilled every day. Healthcare is one of the larger categories, and the categories that Hope Builder is supporting: the MA category, uh, medical assisting category, and the ABA sector under the um, RBT. Uh, category are two of the fastest growing, most uh, needed categories in the U.S. And I, I really applaud uh, and in our community. And I really applaud Shauna and her team because they they do a fantastic job of recognizing the needs in the community, but also the needs of the students. The programs that they have uh, are such that they support. They not only train the students. They pay the students to, to go through the training. They pay the students while they're in their internships. And they, they do it in such a way that, that it works. The 95% retention rate that, that, that uh, Tim mentioned is really outstanding in any type of training category, not let alone in, in the environment that, um, that, that we're talking about here. Uh, the organization has grown and it's prospered and it's, as, as Shauna has mentioned several times, they're just getting started. I heard a, I heard a number uh, earlier today that they want to triple their, they want to triple the impact that they can make in the community uh, and, and throughout Southern California across healthcare and construction. And um, I think it, it just fits nicely, particularly for a company like ours. Uh, we share a lot of the common values. We, we work in a, we work in a for-profit environment, trying to help, uh, trying to help our, our clients uh, better serve their customers, better serve their patients. As is Hope Builders, in that we, you know, one of our pillars is, is that is um, a pillar of culture of caring, and there's no better example that I know than than the work that uh, Shauna and her and her team uh, is doing here. Uh, we also like the idea that it's a social enterprise. It's not just purely uh, a charity. Um, they, they, they do a fabulous job of training, recruiting, placing, and mentoring. They've, they've got uh, a staff that after the assignment starts in, in the environment, they continue to support uh, people like Elsa and the other students that we, we saw over the last several nights for up to two years because it's so hard to get started. It's so hard to stay on course, and it's so critically important that they start in a positive, in a positive way and they can continue uh, that environment because it's it's not easy 
four kids, Elsa, you know, uh, you know, four kids at those ages, you're starting a new career. You've got a great career started. You're making great, uh, a great income. And, and it's not easy to, to stay on track. And the thing I love about Hope Builders is they, they understand that better than, than, than most. And to that end, I, I want to ask everybody on the call to, to really help, uh, help, you know, my family and I, we're, we're supporters, but also our company, Supplemental Healthcare, we're, we're big believers in, in the work that we're doing here and help in two ways. First, we want to, we want to help in, in uh, an Amigo. Uh, an, Amigo uh, an Amigo is a scholarship that, uh, it's a thousand dollar scholarship that, that we, we, we offer to the kids to help support, to help the youth support and, and help train and mentor them, as well as we, in terms of the career registry. And that's the, the bus passes, the medical supply kits, the other things that are needed. So you can go to the website and you can help the students that you, uh, people like Juan and Eddie and Brianne and Elsa that we saw tonight and over the last couple of nights, because the work here is just getting done. Uh, we want to triple the effort over the next couple of years. So please join me in funding an Amigo and also in the career registry. Tim, uh, I applaud you and your leadership and the rest of the board. You guys have made a tremendous impact uh, in, in making this program really the premier workforce solution uh, organization uh, that I know of uh, throughout California. So congratulations, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Wow, thank you, Greg. Um, really interesting perspective after um, you know, helping support and grow the organization over over so many years, and yes, there is a there's a, a an excellent connection between what you're doing and what Hope Builders is doing. So um, let me uh, be sure to thank Shauna. Thank you, Shauna, for all the work that you do, and a great big thank you, Greg, for the uh, for your support uh, for this event and your twenty, you and Sally, your twenty plus years of support. Um, for Hope Builders. Thank you. It's um, according to my satellite, it's uh, 603, might be 903 there, Dominique, for you. Um, so I promised we'd stay really close to on schedule. We have more questions, but we will follow, we will follow up with, with that. I just want to thank everyone. Uh, this ends the program for tonight. Uh, do please log on to our website for more information on how to uh, support uh, Hope Builders. As we've said a couple times, you can fund an Amigo, uh, it's a thousand dollar scholarship, or you can go to our career registry. Um, I know a lot about that. My daughter's getting married soon, so the registry gig. Um, but in our career registry, we have bus passes and childcare and, and medical supplies and tool belts and, and all kinds of stuff. So thank you everyone. Thank you for attending. Thank you for speaking and it is goodbye for now.